evening. You're real people, are you? Good evening. All right. Um, on behalf of the Kennedy Center's chairman, Dave Rutenstein, and our president, Deborah Rutter, and in recognition of the Piscataway people on whose land we stand here at the Kennedy Center, it's um, my pleasure to welcome you to this evening, well, welcome you to the African Lounge at the Kennedy Center Opera House. That's a lot of information to take in. Uh, Piscataway Nation, African Lounge, Opera House, Kennedy Center. And we're here for, uh, for another installation in the Art Change US at Kennedy Center National Conversation Series. And this has really been an extraordinary partnership uh, for the Kennedy Center. And the occasion of this evening's uh, discussion is that it is concurrent with the Washington premiere of a brand new work by an extraordinary artist who is one of our discussants this evening. You'll hear a bit more about him. But the work is called Pelota, and it's about the global culture of soccer and how soccer provides pathways for immigration and integration. So all of these conversations are fundamentally conversations at the intersection of arts and social justice. And I just want to thank our collaborator, uh, Roberta Uno, for guiding us to this intersection. Uh, please join me in welcoming Roberta Uno of Art Change US. Thank you, Bart, and Robert Van Leer, and the whole Deborah Rutter, and the whole Kennedy Center family. We're so honored to be here. This is the third of a series of national conversations. Fourth, Fourth sorry, wow. We are packing them in. Um, and, you know, I, I really love that kind of layering that you did with calling out the Pascataway, recognizing uh, we always want to ask whose land are we on, and then the idea of the Africa Lounge, and then the idea of this immigration dialogue. I think that's what our nation's cultural center really should be about. So, you know, to me, that is so encouraging. I mean, again, when we walk into this building and see those JFK ideals of courage, freedom, service, justice, and gratitude, um, you know, the, the, that isn't easy. There's a lot of work that has been done in order for us to be here, being able to have all those um, ideals come together. But the idea that the arts should be able to lift up people's voices, that we should have independent voices, that we should be able to speak our truths. And so tonight we have a wonderful um, pairing of conversationalists. We have wonderful artists and um, cultural change makers, two who I really admire. Um, First of all, the one I've known the longest, Mark Bamuti Joseph, who's a spoken word poet, he's a performer, he's working in the opera, he was one of the founders of Youth Speaks in San Francisco, which now has a huge network of spoken word poetry organizations as its partners across the country and around the world. Um, he is the curator in chief at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. So really reinventing the way even artistic curation is thought about from the perspective of someone making art. And he will be in conversation with another dear friend, Jose Antonio Vargas. And um, Jose, again, um, really, I think, you know, we both always think about the, the fact that America is changing because of the sacrifices and struggles that happened during the civil rights era the, the legislation that was passed, um, this building is you know, part of that whole legacy. Um, we again, as uh, the three of us and others in this room as children of immigrants, um, many are here because of the National Immigration Act. Uh, some of us, like myself, whose pair, grandparents came in an earlier era, were prevented from citizenship, from owning land, from intermarrying with whites, all of these kinds of things that little by little were struck down and then in a very, very important era in the 1960s really became national law. So we're living in an era where, you know, the room that we're in, that we're seeing this incredible mix of races and people and genders uh, that are present here today and are watching, I think we're all indebted to that era. And I think this is a, a moment where, again, Jose, through being an award-winning journalist, through being a media maker, 
um, through being a filmmaker, through being one of the bravest people I know to go on places that are not necessarily friendly, to be a um, spokesperson and, and media pundit, um, that these are the kinds of rooms and spaces that we are working on to make possible and expand in the future. So I want to welcome Jose and Bamuti, and I'm so excited to be here with you at the Kennedy Center. Welcome. us. Um, if someone from ICE comes in, <laughs> I don't know, call somebody, tweet about it. Uh, but I'm happy to be here and I'm so honored to share the stage with you because you have been walking the walk <laughs> for years now. Sometimes. I, I walk but you're running. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and I try to travel lightly. Um, but actually I was going to ask, um, this is the journalist in me. Um, you wrote this incredible essay right after the inauguration of President Trump, and I'm gonna quote it. I wanna kinda of really start here. Uh, and, and, and the headline of the essay is, my art is not a bridge, it's a battery. And you wrote, as a new president stood atop the Capitol steps last Friday, it was clear that these are not the times to look up for inspiration. I'm an artist, I don't look up. I look around and I question everything. Yes. What is the biggest question <laughs> that you've been trying to answer since that inauguration? Um, the question that I've been thinking about, and, and I think that this is work that you do as well, um, and the question that I've been thinking about that preceded the inauguration is uh, can we design freedom? And this is a question that I consider through my institutional lens. I'm the chief yeah. of program and pedagogy at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Um, and it's absolutely a question that I consider through the art, um, through the art that I make, um, the networking that I do as, um, as someone who engages culture um, for a living, for by vocation, and, and maybe um, um, by birthright in the sense that um, my ancestors worked really hard for me to get to this place in culture, so I don't have much of a choice but to let the burden down. Um, so I think about the design of freedom because there are clearly systems in place that are very well designed that deport us. There are systems in place that incarcerate us. There are systems of surveillance. There are all these mechanisms that um, exclude, extract, segment, um, and oppress. Um, can we design liberation? Um, besides the kind of like um, haphazard or extemporaneous um, feeling that we might get that's attached to inspiration that, we, that is connected to song or movement in our body? Are there ways that we can programmatically um, instill and integrate in our system of being the same way that we have um, a system of enfranchisement yeah. that connects us to the right to vote, let's say, or the right to own land? Um, can we find it in ourselves, that, that space, that not that Mandela freedom, but that Buddha freedom. You know what I mean? Like, not the political freedom, but um, that liberatory energy that we might feel when we are praying or making love or listening to Stevie Wonder. Is it possible to um, put steps in place to get us to that place? Um, and I ask that question, particularly against the backdrop of the current administration, because one, Dude and the administration are hella haphazard. <laughs> but um, there's a couple of things that they get right. Yeah. Or um, all of them are whack. <laughs> um, and all of them are working, in my opinion, against the grain or against um, 
the momentum of human liberation and freedom within the bounds of this country. So um, thank you for bringing that up. When you, so when you, like, uh, when you talked about the essay, when you just kind of mentioned the essay, I was like, oh man, what I say, <laughs> what, I, what I write. Because you know, um, it, we can become ensnared in our own words um, and in our own actions. Um, but it, I also think about all the words that you've laid out for us, um, a kind of roadmap. Um, can you just talk about your career as a writer and why language has been your path? Um, how has language been your path to this stage? Uh, <laughs> you know, this was not, being a writer was not at all the plan. Um, I got here when I was 12, and I think any new immigrant will tell you that our, our roadmap to America and Americans is like movies and television. Mm -hmm. So the Mountain View and the Los Altos public libraries were like museums for me. Like, I love public libraries. I think they tell you what matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they curate, before there was Google, right? Before there was, you know, they curate what the world looks like, mm -hmm. you know? And so it was free. So I borrowed every movie I could borrow. I think I borrowed pretty much everything. And Mrs. Gable at one point said, you're watching things over and over again. <laughs> I'm like, yes, because I'm really confused by them. The, the Woody Allen films confused me. I was like, what is that? And then I remember, I remember there was, a, what was two weeks when I saw Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, um, Sidney, Lumet's, uh, Sidney Lumet's Dog Day Afternoon, um, and then Woody Allen's Husbands and Wives, and, the, um, and um, Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. And of course, you know, this is before Google, but I was so confused as to how those films could have been in the same city, <laughs> right? Because Spike Lee's New York is not right. Woody Allen's New York. Right. And that's like 10 miles apart. Right. So I always wanted to be a filmmaker. That was actually what I wanted to do. And then I studied Mike Nichols. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm totally going to plug the Kennedy Center right now. There's an amazing, uh, when I was reporter at the Washington Post, uh, they used to, they, they still have these Kennedy Center honors. And they honored Mike Nichols, who's probably my favorite director. He directed plays, musicals, and films. And I didn't know until that Kennedy Center honors that Mike Nichols was put on a boat to come to the United States when he was three to wow. escape Nazi Germany. Wow. I didn't know that. That his name was Igor Petrovsky. Well, I got changed to Mike Nichols. Mm. And there was this great, you know, kind of montage of him as a filmmaker and why. So I wanted to be Mike Nichols. Wow. Um, I don't know why. I did. Um, and then I found out I was undocumented when I was 16. I was a freshman in high school. And second, you know, like the spring freshman year. And then I realized, this is the 16-year-old in me thinking, like, if I can't be here because I don't have the right papers, mm. What if my name was on the paper? Because when you wrote an article, it would say by Jose Antonio Vargas. So I thought, hey, maybe that was a way to exist. So writing for me was never, it was never about expression. Mm -hmm. It was never about, it was simply, literally, just my name being on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone wondered what I've done mm -hmm. or how it contributed, I could always say, look, Look at all these, look at these, at one point before I came out as a document that I counted, look at all these 800 news articles that I've written. Like, how can you say it don't exist? Right. Right. So it was never about, that's why for me, writing is such a hard, it's probably the hardest thing I do. Yeah. Um, I find it to be, because you know, I mean, when you write, it's, it's in many ways, it's a, it's a manifestation of your thought process. Yeah. And I never know what I'm really thinking. That's why everything is a question mark. Define American, question mark. <laughs> it's not define American, period, right? So I, 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 I'm amazed that you think it's a roadmap. For me, it's just, I'm just trying to exist in the ways that I know how. You know, I, okay, so I love that. And it reminds me of um, Danel Padilla Peralta. Oh, it's an amazing book. Yeah, um, because he talks about, um, how absurd it is that paperwork, paperwork would define citizenship or how paperwork 
um, defines or excludes or kind of delineates who is a citizen. Um, but one, the idea of writing, writing yourself into existence, that, that sounds like Talib Kweli and Most Deaf to me. Oh, it gosh. sounds like Molefia. <laughs> it sounds like M.K. Asante, the, the Afrocentric guy. Like it, it sounds like the theory of Nomo. So it, it, um, it, it feels very close to me in terms of um, African-based cosmologies. Um, but, it, but it also um, echoes a point that um, Donnell makes about um, how citizenship, how how the foreigner actually calibrates our sense of citizenship. Like how the other, we spend so much time weaponizing fear, yeah. right? And um, kind of um, weaponizing our fear of the other or weaponizing our fear as the foreigner and using that as the means to calibrate who's a citizen and who's not or who has access to the franchise and, and who does not. But this idea that I can write myself, I mean, that's a, uh, your boy, that's uh, Lynn Manuel Moraga. That's, <laughs> that's Hamilton, yeah. right? Like the idea that you can um, write yourself into um, a state of uh, a state of presence and undeniability, and and I wonder how you've been able um, since those eight hundred articles, yeah. since coming out, how you've been able to leverage your art in kind of oh God. re -centering. You know, if I, didn't, if I didn't write and if I didn't make films, I would be so lost. Mm. Just because I think everybody has an, ex in the beginning, six years ago when I came out for the second time, and I'm totally not. <laughs> like, I'm done coming out of that closet. <laughs> the game closet was like in high school, first period of history class, and then the documented part was like 12 years later, the third times. After Which, that, done. Which was easier? Oh, the game thing. Oh, that was much easier. Uh, for me, it was, I had the language for that already. I came out because of AOL chat rooms, do you know what those are? <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was like a bumble, bumble or writer or whatever. It was like pre that, it was like AOL, male, men for men chat rooms. That's how I should go. Because I always have to came out because I found out that I was, I found that I was here illegally around the same time that I found out that I was a faggot, which is what my classmates would say. And this was, I was 16. So 17 was probably the hardest year of my life. Because that was when like, I didn't know who to talk to about any of this. There was no social media, there was no Google, there was no anything. But then, I met the original social network, James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Baldwin, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm really grateful that we're like, having a renaissance now. Of, yeah. um, I Am Not Your Negro is playing on Amazon Prime, please watch it. Yeah. I think it's only yeah. the beginning. Big shout out. That film transcends any category, really. Yeah. But Baldwin, you know, I remember you have to for, you have to force the world to deal with you, not its idea of you. Yes. And then Baldwin was the key to Toni Morrison. Yes. Who was then the key to Maya Angelou? Because they were all friends. I didn't know that. Yeah. What did Maya Angelou say? You know, I am. She was quoting Terence. I am a human being. Nothing human is alien to me. Toni Morrison. We die. That may be the meaning of life but we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. Like those words to me were, you know, if, if laws didn't allow me to be here, if my life was pieces of papers, those words kind of created a map as to how I could write my way into existence wow. without writing about I or me. Like I did not publish a single essay using the word I and me until I was like in my late 20s. I was so afraid of I, me, and my. I think they're the most dangerous words in the English language. Mm -hmm. Because when you use it, how do you use it in such a way that exists beyond yourself, right? Like how is why, you know, when I, when I mentor young journalists now and I see their work and it's all kind of personal essays, I'm like, you know, like the world does not revolve around I, me, and my, it revolves around the rest of us. So like, how do you, how do you, how do you use reportage and synthesis, you know, synthesis and not just get so caught up in yourself? So that's why as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone tells stories, if I didn't have that, everybody was like, hey, why can't you just be the evangelist of immigration? Mm -hmm. I've actually had people tell me that. Mm -hmm. Funders mm -hmm. saying like, hey, can you just be on CNN all day? <laughs> or like people who are like, why are you not protesting in front of the White House or you know, and tying yourself to a fence? Mm -hmm. 
Why are you not leading protests? Why are you, why do you, why are you so privileged? People would ask me. Um, and I didn't really know at that point what that meant. I remember someone in Chicago who was a big immigration activist say to me, this is in the very beginning, say, you can't really represent us. Um, you can't really speak for us. You can't really represent us. You don't share our experiences. You're too successful. And I, and I remember you know, being in the Washington Post newsroom, surrounded by Harvard, Yale graduates, thinking that I didn't belong there. And everybody was asking, who the hell, who the hell let this guy in here? And if I had those feelings there, I felt the same way about the immigrant rights movement. So if I didn't have creation as a big part of my identity, I think I would have been completely, absolutely lost. I think I would probably have self-deported. Because I would not have had, you know, especially now in progressive circles, everybody calls everybody out. Like, you know, and it's all public. So I did this when I was 30, so I kind of knew what I was already, what I do. Which gets back to your point in that essay, which you have to read. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen this. You describe yourself as a creative citizen. Sure. <laughs> like, what does that mean? Because maybe I'll start calling myself that. Creative citizen. Never mind your papers. I'm a creative citizen. Yeah, well, okay, so I think of creative citizens and I think of citizen institutions. Um, the Kennedy Center aspires to be a citizen institution. I think many, and maybe um, that's how I'll back into the question, is to talk about institution first. Huh. Um, because um, at, at Yerba Buena Center, where, um, where I work, or at any art center, really, the kind of history of these buildings, by virtue of their architecture and their place in civic life, um, <coughs> we, we think of these kind of mausoleums for culture, these vaults for culture that um, harbor art but don't necessarily generate culture. And I think- Wait a second, can you say that again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's like deep, you just like, somebody tweet Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, so, so they're, they're, they're places that harbor art rather than generating culture. Mm -hmm. So we take um, a painting or a photograph or a dance that has been prescribed, pre-choreographed, pre-ordained, mm -hmm. we land it in a place and the idea is Let's come and witness the thing that has already been made. Um, here in Washington, D.C., there's a Department of the Interior, and there's a Department of, uh, there's a, um, there's, there are all these like federal buildings that make sure that, um, federal buildings that house people that make sure, again, uh, uh, um, that, the that the systemization of, um, uh, of the country is working. But I always, wonder, well, where's the Department of Inspiration? Not the National Endowment for the Arts, but who's actually making sure that we are creatively inspired, that we are making? Um, and if we don't have that um, on the federal level, if, if, if what we have at the federal level or at the state or local level are systems to make sure that artists receive, you know, less than 1% of you know, their budgets, of, you know, the federal budget or the local budget, that's what we have but we don't necessarily have machines that keep it churning. But a place like the Kennedy Center, a place like Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, or the Walker Arts Center in yeah. Minneapolis, or you know, constant, art, constant um, uh, several art centers around the country, I think that's our role in civic life, to be creative institutions, to be citizen institutions, to actually take it upon ourselves, not to just like show the work, but to make the culture happen. So who works at these institutions? I would hope creative citizens. But who works outside of those institutions? Again, I would hope that the creative citizens among us who take it upon ourselves to think intersectionally, intergenerationally, yeah. to think about um, equity and inclusivity in, um, in really meaningful ways, but also to keep hope and inspiration um, churning. Hope and inspiration as hokey as it may sound, these are um, these are renewable resources, you know, like the sun, and and that's that's the future that I aspire to, is like um, a, a world where inspiration is currency, you know, like empathy, like water, inspiration. So who does that work? Who who um, takes on that work? Um, maybe your postal carrier. 
you know, maybe your letter carrier, you know, maybe the person that works at your Trader Joe's, or you know, maybe the person that works at, at a bowling alley. Um, but most likely, most probably, the artists among us, the weirdos, the folks on the fringe, um, the folks who take it upon themselves to invest in ideas and to invest in the generation and regeneration of ideas. So when you think of the creative community, part of my struggle right now is when it comes to being an artist and the role of the artist, mm -hmm. how do you balance expression with connection? Like, I've been doing, I, I've been obsessed with white people. Yeah. <laughs> I just, no, I just really want to understand. When I say that, I don't, because you know, people on Twitter are like, go after me and stuff. Like, hi. <laughs> uh, I really love you. I was raised by many of you. My high school principal, my speech and debate coach. Say like, that again. Oh, I love them. But like, but the thing is for me, it was interesting. When I was being raised by them, I never considered them white. I never, it wasn't until I left Mountain View, California, which is like my Green Gables in Avenue. <laughs> right? Like it was like, that's why I love Adam Green Gables. It was like, that's like, my, Mountain View is like my Avenue, right? Then I left, like, and, and Shirley did. I can't believe I'm bringing up Adam Green Gables right now. She left and then she got to meet the real world. And then I got to DC. Right after college, I went to DC. That's when I met real white people. Mm -hmm. Right? The white people that put it in your place. The white people that tell you that the system is not for you. The people that tell you that you have to write a certain way, like Ibsen. I'm like, who the hell is Ibsen? I didn't know. Like, right? Like, I literally had an editor tell me once, like, you know, um, writing this essay, it's like, it's like reading Ibsen. And I'm looking at him like, who's Ibsen? And then he goes, you've never taken a creative writing course? Oh, wow. <laughs> like, no, I was too busy trying to like make a living. I don't know. Like, but that's when I met. When, it, when I say that, I mean the systems that are in place to center whiteness as a default. Yes. And how in many ways, really in the next few years, if not decades, our job together is to decenter that. Yes. And, and this is where I think the work of someone like Toni Morrison has been incredibly um, prescient and necessary, right? And how do we do that without hurting white people. Yeah. Like how do we do that with empathy, with radical empathy, right? Mm -hmm. And what I say to white people when I do this stuff is I'm like, yo, we're actually trying to help you out. <laughs> when, you, when, when, when you're making white people for MTV, I remember this young white woman who said, being white is the default, it's the norm. Yeah. And I remember when we cut the camera and you know, we had a break, I approached her, the camera wasn't on, the camera should have been on. And I was asking her, God, what a burden that must be. <laughs> to walk around thinking you're the norm. To walk around thinking you're the center and you're the default. Is that why when white people go to Africa to take a picture with a bunch of black people? Because they're like, oh my God, we're not the norm. Is that why that happens? But, so we're actually trying to help you out by saying, guess what, you're not the center of the world. You're not the norm, you're not the default. We all are. The sooner we realize that, the better it is for all of us, including white people. So, but then that takes a lot of empathy. Yes. Right? And my connection, of course, is always about Baldwin. When I was reading The Fire Next Time, when I was in high school, I remember um, the epigraph before the essay was White Man's Burden by Rudyard Kipling. I didn't know who Rudyard Kipling was. Uh, recently, I looked it up, and the name of that poem is called The White Man's Burden. The subtitle was The United States and the Philippine Islands. The poem was written by Kipling mm. and sent to senators like Teddy, Ro the Teddy Roosevelt mm. to convince America to enter into empire. That it was the burden of white people to colonize and imperialize these people that they call half devil and half child. So thinking back now, and, uh, more than 100 years later, what is the, how, does that, how does that burden manifest itself? What are the systems in place, right? And how do we centralize everyone? Uh, this is why, you know, this idea of, we literally are creating a new language around this. Also, when I read your essay, I was really struck by this idea of a creative citizen and the, the central role that they will play. Because politicians are not gonna do this. They're too busy trying to get elected. Yeah. 
No, you know, I, I was at the University of Iowa not so long ago. Uh, <laughs> piece Pitlota, the long, well, actually not a very long story. We were performing Pitlota at the Andrew Auditorium. And uh, I was in a, um, in a class with about 90 young people, many of them juniors and seniors. It was this elective class, and I was kind of guest appearing. I won't say I was guest lecturing, but I was, I was in their class with them, and um, somebody asked me about the connection between art and politics. Um, because for this person, maybe there didn't need to be that connection. Maybe, you know, for this person, um, it's not that she was critical, but she was aware that people were critical of um, or undergirding your art with a, um, with a kind of polemic. Um, and she asked me, um, you know, what I thought about that. And I asked her if she knew who her congressperson was. <laughs> and she didn't. And it was, like I said, it was a room of 80 or 90 people. And I asked the whole room of juniors and seniors, so, you know, folks of voting age in the state of Iowa, the bellwether, right, for, <laughs> for the rest of the political season, um, how many people knew who their congressperson was? And about four or five wow. um, of these young people raised their hands, which to me isn't necessarily an indictment. I don't know if I knew who my congressperson yeah. was at, at, you know, 19 or 20. I, did, I do know that, you know, um, Barbara Lee is yeah. my congressperson, you know. <laughs> She, she actually, because, you know, it's hot. Like, Barbara Lee actually does speak for me, so I actually yeah. do feel represented. Um, but, um, you know, I asked her um, if she knew um, Chance, who Chance the Rapper was. And she said, yeah. And I said, you know who Kendrick Lamar is? She said, yeah. <laughs> I said, um, your congressperson isn't your leader. Those musicians are. You know their words, but you don't know how your congressperson is, is voting, right? So there's, there's always this way that art and culture proceed, and, and yeah. this is our, to invoke our boy Jeff Chang, where um, art and culture precede policy. Yep. And whatever it is that we're, you know, whether it's um, the Laramie Project or Brokeback Mountain mm -hmm. or um, I Am Not Your Negro or Do the Right Thing, there's a way that... Um, that cultural language is introduced into the marketplace and into civic discourse. And whether it takes a year or five years or 10 years, um, that's when actual norms start showing up. Once we have a language, whether it's, you know, we, we don't have Barack Obama if we don't have hip hop culture. Yeah. We don't have the 45th president if we don't have the comment section of the internet. Or reality television. <laughs> or reality television, right? You know, like, I mean, it's been kind of fascinating to me how the limitations of television, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like the hot and cold medium, right? When, um, when, when, when that was being discussed, when the first televised debate between Kennedy and Nixon. And in many ways, Trump, to me, is a manifestation of oversimplification and how mm. we, have, we, have, we have surrendered ourselves to it. Word. And I really, um, and I'm saying this as someone who used to be a political reporter at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just remembered when Trump announced he was running for president. Mm -hmm. It was a month after we premiered White People on MTV. Mm -hmm. And I started telling all my political reporter, my political reporter friends that I actually think Trump may win this thing. Mm -hmm. Just because I've been traveling around like a walking comfortable conversation mm -hmm. for the past five years. Mm -hmm. And I had been to a lot of these places that to me, look like they were going to vote for Trump. But I remember being completely dismissed by all of my political reporter friends, mm -hmm. saying, oh, no way, the Clinton machine, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mm -hmm. you don't understand. Yeah. Like, the fact that his message is so simple, the yeah. fact that he told people right from the very beginning, he pointed, that's who you blame. Yeah. And I remembered, we, we are living in a country where there are 33 million Mexicans in America. 33 million, 22 million of whom are U.S. born American citizens. Wow. And yet, as we travel around the country at Define America, and as, we, as we do the work that we do, the word illegal is literally interchangeable for Mexican people. Wow. I've been in places where once they find out that I'm not Mexican, they're like, oh, but you know, the Mexicans, the illegals, just interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, one of my dearest friends is Cristela Alonso. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with her. Mm -hmm. The first Mexican um, woman to write, produce, and star in her own network comedy show oh, wow. called Christelle on ABC. Oh, it word. came out the same year that Blackish and Fresh Off the Boat mm. did. 
but for whatever reason, her show didn't get the kind of support that Fresh Off the Boat mm. or Blackish ever got. Mm. So now she's starring in her first, she's, be, she's gonna be the first Latina and the first Mexican woman to be in a Pixar movie. Wow. Cars 3, it's premiering next week. <laughs> and she and I were just talking about how, you know, like it's not like, you know, she is a part of, you know, America Ferreira, Eva Longoria. Mm. There, there aren't a lot of Latinas out there, but specifically Mexican women. Out yeah. There. Yeah. And here's Cristela, you know, like, uh, uh, grew up in poverty, mm -hmm. and a, you know, an immigrant, a documented immigrant mother, um, and, you know, like, I, I, I think of her and I think of the journey that she's in and how underrepresented um, Latinos and Latinas are in general. Yeah. And, and, and for me, it's interesting even in the language that we use. Mm -hmm. Like, my, my, my niece the other, last week started asking me, uncle, do you check Asian or, like, what do you check like on, this, on the forms? Yeah. And I said, well, usually I try to find the other and I put Filipino down. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, when did we become Asian? Yeah. I was like, that's a really good question. Yeah. I think in the same way that people became white and black yeah. and then Hispanic and then Latino. Like, you know, yeah. America tries to put that in, this, in these boxes. Yeah, sure. And now we're all trying to kind of get out of them. Yeah. And again, only art and creative citizens. I, I would I would count um, uh, Patrice and Alicia. Oh I would I would, God, I would, yes. I would count uh, the, the Opal exactly the, yeah. the founders of Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter. Matter. Um, you know, earlier I, I talked about weaponizing fear, and Alicia in particular um, <laughs> talks about weaponizing love. She doesn't use those those phrase that particular phrase, but she does talk about love at the center of her action. Um, and I've kind of, for personal use, I've just kind of abstracted that to think about weaponizing love in the same way that um, we create these categories to, you know, to segment again back to the design, back to yeah, the design, design of, our, um, of our forward movement. Um, I, I, I have to ask you because um, I think that we've... Um, glossed over a lot of things. You've mentioned the film, you've mentioned Define America, but um, white people, very, very interesting film. <laughs> a lot of people hated it. Well, great. Which was great. That's, yeah, how, sure. you, that's how you know you're doing something good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? But can you just walk us back a little bit in terms of the, your biography, just a little yeah. bit? If you could just um, tell us how you got to um, making the film for MTV, white yeah. people, and what are what are the things that you found most surprising as you walk through the world, as you walk through that particular world, as you made the. the film? So actually, my first film I did after I came out was documented. It was okay. about being undocumented and like I traveled around the country, and actually the film ended up being about my mom mm. because I haven't seen her for 24 years this August, mm -hmm. and so the film ended up being kind of this interesting. The place where she and I can meet is on film. Mm -hmm. So I sent a film crew to film her in the Philippines while I stayed here and we Skyped. And it's a really interesting film. But I noticed when I travel around the country, and we've done like more than 800 events in 48 states in the past six years, whenever I talked about immigration, a rally, an event, a panel, whatever, the, co the question and answer was always about race. Interesting. Whenever I got in front of people, I'm talking about immigration, broken immigration system, the processes that people don't even know about. But then the conversation was always about race. Mm -hmm. And so that, I was intrigued by that. And so instead of making documented part two, mm -hmm. I made white people. Uh -huh. And a lot of it was because I was surprised at how many white people didn't know their own immigrant backgrounds. Yeah. Even the lies that have been perpetuated about my great, great, great grandparents did it the right way. Yeah. Well, what was the right way? Yeah. You mean when the potato famine happened and wiped out Ireland and you got on boats and you got here and showed up with no papers? Was that the right way? Mm -hmm. Right? Was, was it the right way when we got here and all of a sudden, you know, because there was never, Ellis Island didn't require a visa process. Mm -hmm. So white people for me was what happens now that white people who have been in the majority for so long, demographically speaking, are now becoming the minority. For the first time in American public schools from K to 12, white students are in the minority. Yeah. So the film was an examin the, the special was an, an examination of that. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised, I was telling you earlier today, right? When we were making the film for MTV, we did a study. 71% of white people live in predominantly white towns. 
I did not know that because mm -hmm. I grew up in cities my entire life. Mm -hmm. And 90% of white people only have white friends. Okay. Listening to Drake and Rihanna does not count. Okay, but can we, can we stop right there? Because so then white people are a quantitative minority, but in their own worlds, are the not, not, not yes. a cultural minority. Yes. Um, so um, we, we do this work around um, toxic masculinity. <laughs> and we, you know, we ask, um, what do you love about being a man that has nothing to do with power? Like, what do you, what do you love about being a man that, um, that isn't predicated on your perceived capacity to lord yourself over um, another? And I think about that in the context of white people as I hear you say that. Like, what, what do you love about being white? Right? In the, in the way, it's like, I can name, I love being black. And, um, you know, I've named maybe a zillion ways even in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it has everything to do with culture, like with actual culture, cultural expression, and, uh, and cultural capital, and yeah. affinity, you know, my various affinities within that. But I, um, I, I wonder, like, as you traveled, what were the things besides power, or was it only power? Well, for me, what was stunning was the invisibility of power. The fact that it wasn't, they didn't even, the, we, we, we have been so blinded and we have so, I've been unwilling to unpack systems that are in place that a lot of young white people I talked to didn't even know those systems existed, right? Like for example, mm -hmm. one of the most perpetuated lies in American schools and has been for a while now is that young people of color get more scholarships than white students, right? Mm -hmm. When we did a study, we found out that nearly 47% of young white people feel that they're as much a victim of racial discrimination as people of color. Mm. The number one reason, college scholarships, mm. right? That is, a, that is a complete lie. It yeah. is not a fact, yeah. right? Like white people do not receive less scholarships than people of color. Yeah. And yet, because it fits this idea that we are now, quote unquote, in the minority or, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, there, was a, there was a black woman who got that job. There was a, I, mm. I was fascinated by, in many ways, this harkens to this idea that we have never really fully told this country's whole story to itself. We have not. And I think that's the moment that we're in now, is figuring out what, which is why on Twitter, and you, you were asking me about this a, a few minutes ago before this started, mm -hmm. like, and you know, and Twitter is perfect for simplistic conversations, right? <laughs> and projections, it's just perfect. 140 characters, you get what you need, you validate yourself, bite yourself in the back, then you go. Um, but it's been fascinating how even terms like being racist and being prejudiced. I got into this thing the other day on the fact that people of color can't be racist. Yeah. We can be prejudiced against white people, against other people of color, mm -hmm. but we cannot be racist because we didn't create racism. Yeah. Right? Toni Morrison calls it defensive racism. Mm -hmm. Right? And just even that term alone, how white people personalize. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, during white people, we had this one scene that we, for whatever reason, we didn't put it in the film because the camera wasn't working properly. But it was, we were filming a young white gay man in the South, North Carolina, Dakota, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who decided to go to a historically black college. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, has black friends. Mm -hmm. We're filming him, and my, one of the producers, Erica Clark, a black woman, started noticing that whenever he wanted to say black or African American, he would stop himself. Mm -hmm. like, you know, they, mm. them, right? So finally, Erica got so frustrated, we're filming, Erica says, cut, 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 runs towards Dakota and says, Dakota, you can say black. Wow. As a black woman, I'm giving you permission to say black. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? What do you think happened? He still said that in day. He cried. Wow. He cried because the mere, the mere acknowledgement mm -hmm. of color. Yeah, broken. Not just that, you weren't allowed to do it. And then I started realizing, oh, this is Barney's legacy. I love you, you love me, we're a happy family, we're colorblind, mm -hmm. right? It's like mm -hmm. colorblindness as a norm, mm -hmm. as, and people, I don't know, I hope, you know, I'm hoping Martin Luther King was alive so he can tell people that when he said, judge not by the color of the skin, he was actually mm -hmm. talking about something deeper. Mm -hmm. The fact that the right has co-opted and has 
vandalize that that saying mm -hmm. to fit kind of their color blindness mm -hmm. theology mm -hmm. to me is like crazy. But color blindness is, is a norm. Yeah. And then I started thinking that's why white people get so a lot of white people get very upset just by being called out as white. Yeah. Because you're not even supposed to see that. Yeah. Right? So that and now and now that you add Latinos and Asians to the mix, no wonder we we are where we are. Mm -hmm. It's also increasingly difficult to understand, and we talked about this as a group um, earlier today, it's also difficult to fully understand how to exercise your allyship, yeah. I think, um, a across culture. I, um, you know, there's, there are ways that inside of a community or inside communities of um, kind of either choice or marginalization inside, um, in these inside communities, um, we readily grant these permissions mm -hmm. much easier. Um, you know, the, the unfortunate joke that Bill Maher made um, on, a, on Friday night, if Dave Chappelle had said the same thing, it would have been hilarious. I thought. Yeah. But Bill Maher, you're not allowed to do that because you're not inside the community. And a now lot he of, dates black women, though. Well, okay, exactly. So, that's so that, 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 I don't know. that I don't makes know. him down. Well, clearly, clearly he has black friends because <laughs> he, he felt comfortable enough. He felt comfortable enough. But, there's, but that thing of being inside of a community and um, what we are asking in allyship as we define mm -hmm. American yeah. um, and as we talk about inclusivity, you know, what, what do we actually mean by shifting paradigms of power? Who are we willing to include? You, you know, you made allusion to it earlier, but how do we create pathways of allyship that don't feel um, or that don't make folks in power or perceived center to feel like they are losing their livelihoods or losing their country or losing their ability? Like th those things are continue to be fascinating to me because I think that that actually is, is our collective burden. And mm -hmm. I actually, and, and, I, and I love the notion of, you know, define American because it has to be something that we do together. And, it has to be. And I think it's the moment right now is forcing us to that. Like I was just, this country, you gotta, you gotta love America. They won't give me a green card, but they give me honorary degrees. Yeah. So I got one last week <laughs> uh -huh. at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the only school in America with criminal justice on the name. It's, mm -hmm. it's a CUNY school, mm -hmm. and you know, which is amazing. And I brought my grand my grandmas with me to the ceremony. But this was the first time I thought about it. But this was at Arthur Ashe Stadium, which is a huge stadium. Yeah. And while I was on stage for three hours, because it was like 1,400 graduates and they read everybody's name, which was awesome, uh -huh. I was staring at an ad by the watch company Citizen. Uh, so I'm sitting there, and there's like this citizen ad, like mm -hmm. daring me to look at it the entire time. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to give this commencement speech thing, and so I kind of like talked about the fact that I've been staring at this word, and when I found out that I can never be a citizen. Okay, can you, um, for, oh, the, for the people watching at home, yeah. why can't you get your green card? Because when I came out of um, being undocumented six years ago, I did something that every immigration lawyer told me not to do. Okay. <laughs> which is I admitted all the fraud I committed. So every time I lied to an employer about being a U.S. citizen, it's a false claim to citizenship. And it's the highest offense you can do yeah. is to do false claim of citizenship. One of the lawyers said to me, the very fact that you lied about being a U.S. citizen may be the only reason why you will never become a U.S. citizen. So I can't like marry my way into this like Sandra Bullock in the proposal. Like that doesn't it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, I can't you know even though I've created I employ fifteen people I've created businesses I can't just get one of these visas that Jared Kushner is passing around. I can't. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he's doing there. Mm -hmm. I want to investigate more. Mm -hmm. um, I can't right. So mm -hmm. really the only option is to leave, mm -hmm. self deport. Mm -hmm. Which I have to be honest with you. I actually really thought about after the election. Mm. I thought, I'm about to be 36 years old. I kind of want to go see the world. Mm. <laughs> what if I just leave? Yeah. And then again, I'm reminded by the holy trinity <laughs> of Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, and James Baldwin. You stay, right? I mean, Baldwin went to France, but he was always here. Yeah. Um, so the word citizen to me, if I can't be a citizen because I don't have the right papers and I, the laws don't permit it, 
I had to believe early on in life that there's another form of citizenship, which is citizenship by participation. Yes. Word up. You show up. Yep. You engage with people who don't even think you're a human being. Mm. You, you have to believe that the world does not revolve around you mm. and that your issue is deeply connected. Mm. Like even now, sitting in this room, the Africana room, right? Yes. I'm thinking and talking to you, one of the leading artists mm. of this country mm. who happens to be African American. Mm -hmm. The debt that I owe black culture and black history mm -hmm. is tremendous, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's at all accidental mm -hmm. that you know, in this country, you know, Alicia Garza, one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement, said that the Black Lives Matter movement is also about citizenship. Not citizenship like papers, but citizenship as dignity. Absolutely. So how do we now, as communities, work together? Yeah. And how do we participate in each other's lives? So um, I love global football. I'm a, I'm a jock. I grew yeah, so up, yeah. talk so, to me about that. Bible. Well, yeah. yeah, so I, I, I grew up playing this sport, um, you know, the sport of soccer. And um, my piece, Pelota, which is yep. uh, happening here this weekend, um, is, a, is a piece that looks at um, my parents' immigration story, that looks at race, that looks at fatherhood through the lens of global football. <laughs> and um, as a way of, um, as a way of um, activating this work outside of the theatrical space, um, we uh, made something in conjunction with the Guggenheim Museum called Moving and Passing. Um, my um, proudest work is in education and the place where, you know, that freedom that I was talking about, yeah. the freedom that exists in the body, um, for me, when I, when I um, recognize when I reference that feeling in my own body it's on a soccer field and I can feel wow. I can feel the wind in my ears I goal scoring whatever happens to um, you know to men and women after they score a goal you know that thing that happens yeah, they start yeah, throwing yeah. their clothes around and they just kind of lose it like that's freedom <laughs> to me so um, so we we made moving and passing and we were able to exercise this um, this module here with DC scores, with the Kennedy Center, with, um, with folks in my, uh, in my company. And basically what moving and passing does is it, it locates, and we work with uh, Fabiana Rodriguez's um, Culture organization, yeah. Culture Strike as well. Um, basically, we, um, um, moving and passing is a political action that identifies the beauty of migration as a modality and says the same way that you move around on a soccer field, the same way that even when you don't have the ball on a soccer field, um, you're still moving without the ball with your eye on everything moving, just trying to keep pace. Just as that happens, just as how you have to develop strategies even when you yourself are not in possession, that's the way that you operate on a soccer field. It's also the way that you can work through life. So um, most of the young people that we deal with um, as we, uh, do this practice um, don't come from the United States. They were not born here. Um, when we did this in the South Bronx and when we did this um, in DC a few weeks back, um, we found that ultimately folks come from 30 different countries from around the world. Yeah. Um, that um, most people, when we did this in the South Bronx, I asked the kids, and there were about 200 assembled, how many folks had parents that were born um, in this country? And nobody raised their hands. Right? So one of the things that we have to pass on is this sense of, um, instead of immigration or emigration, this idea of migration, this sense of the beauty of movement. Yeah. And of, um, and, you, know, you, you use the word empathy, but, but the, the way that we're able to um, move without necessarily being at center, still in service yeah. of the greater good, or still in service of the ultimate goal. It, it requires a reorientation psychologically, I think, in the collective psyche, and it also requires a different relationship to our histories, right? Because movement is natural. You said- Is there anything more natural in the world than movement? I, I don't know, man. So, I, I, have, I have trouble just sitting we, down we, right no, here. We, 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 we were talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. 244 million migrants in the world according to the United Nations. That's most ever in the history of this world. One more time, migrants, please. Migrants, refugees, 244 million people are migrants around the world, right? And they are moving for reasons, the push-pull factors of migration, right? 
Why do people move? We are so busy obsessing over borders and walls mm -hmm. that we haven't even begun, be, begun to scratch the surface and ask the deeper questions of why are people moving? Well, Climate change, of course, Paviano yes. Rodriguez has talked about a lot about. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, you know, there are 4.5 million Filipinos in the United States. They're the third largest immigrant group. It's Mexicans, Chinese, and then us. And I was doing this event in North Carolina, and this gentleman, it was a, it was a tea party thing. This gentleman was like, why are there so many of you here? <laughs> And he didn't ask that in a nice way. And all I could say was, you know, sir, we are here because you were there. Yeah. That's why we're here. Yeah. Is it any surprise about what's happening in Africa as it mm. relates to Europe? Mm. And why is it that when you move, it was called manifest destiny and white man's burden? Right. Yet when we move, the question is, is it a crime? Yeah. Like this is to me, but again, politicians and diplomats, mm -hmm. they're too busy trying to keep their jobs. The job yeah. falls onto the artists, the yeah. creative citizens. The creative citizens, and it's, and it's true that folks are not actually afraid of culture moving, they're afraid of people moving. Yes. Because if it's martial arts or religion or food they're or down fashion, with they're, down, Lee, they're, down you know? with, they're down with the, the spread of culture. They're not down with either the, the, the browning or the reorientation or kind of the, the reprioritization of um, you know, their, their censuses, of their counting. It's, it's, the, it's the counting numbers. And I just have to say before we start taking some questions here, this is why I think the work that Art Change Us is doing that Roberto Onu is leading, yes. in terms of figuring out how do you remap, how do you reframe, mm -hmm. how do artists play a central role in their own communities as creative citizens mm -hmm. to facilitate conversations, mm -hmm. to support and curate a kind of work that tells us who we're becoming mm -hmm. in a way that brings us together, Word. right? So, all right, some questions. Some of these are pretty deep ones, and uh -oh. you're going to have to answer them. <laughs> Hilarious. Can you talk a little bit about the cultural differences between immigrants of color and people of color born in America? You start. Nah, wait. <laughs> Let me repeat. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the cultural differences between immigrants of color and people of color born in America? Well, actually, you should start because I know no because I know that Define American is doing oh, work yeah. in the city of Chicago specifically around anti-blackness. And if if oh, I oh we were not supposed to announce it publicly, but you just did. So oh, hey, Chicago, damn, sorry. we're gonna do no. It's cool. It's cool because you know you're. you're <laughs> <laughs> so we're we are actually about to embark on a series of videos, narratives on anti-blackness in immigrant communities in mm -hmm. Chicago. Um, so how do we in our Latino, Latinx, Muslim, Arab, and immigrant families, mm -hmm. like how do we learn to be anti-black? Mm -hmm. How does it play into the generational differences between mm -hmm. what, you know, my grandma, I remember my grandma, <laughs> I have a lot of grandmothers, mm -hmm. but one of them made a joke to me once about, just don't bring home a black guy. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Are you, are you kidding me with this? Yeah, so, so one of the things that we traffic in as a country yeah. is white supremacy. Yes. And, and it's, it's fascinating that we are able to kind of export and distribute white supremacy even in the absence of white people. Uh, well, I think white people are going to be relieved that they're not at all in the video series, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because literally people of color talking amongst ourselves mm -hmm. about what is it that we subscribe to. Mm -hmm. And I actually think this video series, which we're still kind of in pre-production mode, mm -hmm. I think in many ways if we do it right, it, it, it would really expose what white supremacy is. Mm -hmm. Like why is it that people, you know, like there's a joke within the Asian community about Asian people being the closest to white. Mm -hmm. And I've always been so uncomfortable. I don't, I don't know what that means, mm -hmm. right? Like what does it mean that there are many Latino, you know, Latino and Latinas who don't, want, who don't want to identify as Latino or Latina, and they check white in the census? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that mean? Like, what are mm -hmm. we signing up for? Yeah. If we don't even know what whiteness is, mm -hmm. what are immigrants signing for for whiteness when they think they're signing up for it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, so, so then as to the question, um, it's, uh, it's I'm deep. glad it's the first question. It's a very deep question. I can only speak anecdotally yeah. about my parents' experience. I'm first generation <laughs> born in this country. Both my parents were born in Haiti. And they both um, immigrated to this country in the 1960s. Hmm. So, you know, there is, I, you know, I can channel them. I can channel um, Barack Obama's father. I can, I can reference a time where, um, at least in the black community, the otherness was somehow 
diffused yeah. by, um, by the transgression of the border. In other words, there was a little bit, a slightly different pass given to someone that came from across the border. You know, we, we yeah. um, Roberta mentioned the Immigration Act and, um, and we talked about it before um, coming on. But there's a slightly different pass, I think, in um, then. Hmm. I think now, um, you know, many of the things that you just referenced still come up. I, I can't, um, I don't want to trade or weigh and balance different people's burdens yeah. or the ways that different people um, have to um, engage systemic pathologies that kind of frame what happens in this country and outside of it. So I, I won't speak to um, an overarching monolithic difference yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, inside of the experiences. But I will say that what we have in common is what many of us have in common which is that we are referenced in opposition to whatever it is that's supposed to be normal. And, and so then by extension, we are placed in opposition to joy or placed in opposition to the range and full spectrum of human emotion and capacity. And having to overcome that is something that we do share. Here's a personal question in terms of joy. <laughs> What do you do to bring more pleasure and joy into your personal lives? I have a feeling that I know who asked that question. Yeah, I don't can't tell the handwriting. Who did yeah. who asked this question? Yeah. Jose, what do you do? No, but uh, what, what do, do you I do? do? Pleasure and joy in your personal life. I am making an effort, actually, like, I haven't gone out on a date date for like, mm -hmm. oh, that's so personal. But hey, you want personal. Mm -hmm. So like, three years? Mm. I just, I have no time. And so I just turned 36, as I said, and so I'm like, yo, I gotta make time. Like, so how do I do this? And how I do not do this without going on any of these social media stuff? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like whatever social media sites you go to to find people to date. Mm -hmm. So that's been really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but just finding personal time, mm -hmm. um, it's been really tough, you know, yeah. especially now that I don't actually live anywhere. Like I had to, I'm basically a nomad right now because I, I can't have a permanent address. So just in case they want to like issue a warrant of arrest. Um, so it's tough, but I'm, I'm actually forcing myself in the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna go out on like a date date. Oh my God, I can't believe, I hope the person's not watching. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. We could just be friends too, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Bring me joy, bring me bring pleasure. Bring me joy, bring me peace. So, um, my, my uh, I, I will say. Okay, so, you. Yeah, your yeah. Job. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, my wife, Kanoilani, she brings me joy. My kids, Makai and Anea, they bring me joy. Um, yeah. Um, walking our dogs. Um, God, that sounds so awesome. Yeah, we have a big dog and a little dog, Momo and Daisy. Uh, yeah, they're hilarious together. Um, I, I, uh, there's lots of laughter there. Um, I, you know, the Golden State Warriors and how they beaten that ass right now brings me joy, dog. It does. It does. Um, yeah, all the, yeah, um, there's, you know how, like, um, I don't know about y'all, but right around the election and definitely around the inauguration, I couldn't watch CNN and MS, MSNBC. For, I couldn't do, do any of that stuff because I didn't want to see dude's face. And then what was I going to do? I was just going to cry, be angry. So um, in the days leading up to the finals, just uh, now the basketball finals, I couldn't watch ESPN, which for the people who know me really well know, it's like, then what did you do with yourself? <laughs> like, I, I couldn't do it because it just like heightened the anxiety. So now that we are like in control, I can go ahead and I can listen to sports radio and this kind of stuff. Um, these things, they're not just um, distractions. They um, maybe are, are ways for me to um, uh, kind of rekindle a physical impulse in myself, which again kind of tracks back to this thing of using my body in order to leave it. 
So that's, Oof. yeah, that's being on the dance, like when DJ Rich Medina is, you know, <laughs> is spinning, that brings me joy. The Midnight Marauders album, always. Yeah, so. Like I just that. have to say this, because my, my grandmother might be watching this. So, because she loves Facebook. Um, <laughs> so actually this past week, I took four grandmothers mm. to the East Coast. Mm. They flew from San Jose, California, where I grew up, and I grew up, and took them to New York. And then to, of course, they wanted to go gamble and do the slots in the Atlantic City. And then to D.C. <laughs> and two of my grandmothers um, have never been to the East Coast. And one mm -hmm. of them came to this country in 1963, mm. Florida. Mm -hmm. And she is the reason why we're here. I'm holding, by the way, a book by John F. Kennedy. Um, if you have not read it, you should read it. It's called The Nation of Immigrants. Um, a really singular book written by a president about immigration policy. Um, of course, Kennedy being... Uh, an Irish Catholic, right? Um, a son of immigrants who came to this country. Mm, say that. Um, but if it wasn't for Kennedy, the Kennedy brothers in particular, uh, the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act would not be a reality and the country would not look the way that it does today. That, that changed the demographic makeup of this country, mm. right? And so because of that Immigration Act, my grandma Flory came to the country in 93, they passed Act in 65, she could then petition my grandfather, her younger brother, to come here. Mm -hmm. Then my grandfather brought my grandmother, and then when they couldn't figure out to get their first grandson here, they smuggled me and paid a smuggler $4,500 wow. to illegally bring me here when I was 12. Mm. So even explaining that, and so I have to say, Joy was explaining what Ellis Island was to my four grandmothers and taking them there. Mm. And like going through the tour, we didn't need the audio tour, I was the loud audio tour for them. <laughs> mm. And it was so interesting how my four US naturalized grandmothers didn't know the history of Ellis Island. Mm. It wasn't part of the test. And you know, when I took them to that part of Ellis Island in which they actually tell you about African slaves who, that were imported, and I was explaining to my grandmother, Flory, that they were in ships and they were they were chained to each other. She was like, what? Lola, that means grandmother in Tagalog. They were chained to each other. They had to pee on each other. They had to, that's what they had to do. She's like, oh no, no, I can't read this. This is too upsetting. No, Lola, you have to read it. Yeah. Right? And then there was a section on indigenous people. Right? A very short section. <laughs> Should be a lot longer. Um, and it was just interesting that my, my grandmothers, who are here legally, who are U.S. citizens, did not know mm. the history of Ellis Island. Mm. And I, again, I started thinking about citizenship by participation. And this is really uncomfortable. Like, you know, from California, where I'm from, where I grew up, um, a lot of my Filipino-American relatives, they think of America as something you buy, something you wear, something you eat. Right. It's not something you participate in. My yeah. aunt, after the election, I asked her, hey, did you vote? She's like, no. I'm yeah. like, after all the Facebook postings that I put, you mean you didn't vote? Yeah. And she's like, I've sent your cousin to school. I have the Camry. She bought the older Camry. She has a house. She's mm. done. Yeah. Like, to me, that's why this whole idea of what we owe to each other mm -hmm. as citizens of this country um, is incredibly, incredibly important. Say that again, man. It's What uh, we owe to each other. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Baldwin, this is a marriage, you and I. Yes. Right? Like, I God, I remember reading that when I was in high school and I'm like, whoa, what? But I don't want to be married to people. <laughs> but guess what we are? Yeah. And, I, and again, when I think about the language that has to be created mm -hmm. so that we can see each other in each other, mm. right? Um, and who's gonna provide that vocabulary? You know, of course, clearly, you know, um, there are people who have been saying this, but now getting popular culture to reflect that, how do we change in cultural institutions? Roberto Uno talks a lot about cultural equity, yeah. like who runs and curates our museums and performing arts. Yes. What do we consider to be the canon of American theater? Yeah. Right? Who do we include in that? Mm -hmm. what, what gets to be performed at the Kennedy Center? Mm -hmm. um, all of that. Yeah. So I, hey, as long as you're not deporting me, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to be as creatively disruptive as I possibly can. Word up, bro. Word up. So I can't read this question. Can you read this for me? Oh, where did it go? Are there more? Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, okay. Here. 
that's a hard one. Can I skip that one? Uh, but, <laughs> this is for you. When you mention a community, like that uh, community, like the one that uh, Bill Maher was not a part of, is it possible for us to get lost in these communities and become too privileged with them? Yeah, so this maybe, that's a great question. Maybe this tracks back a little bit to the essay and to the title of the essay uh, that you mentioned at the top of our um, yeah. time together. My art is not a bridge. It's a battery. It's a battery. So part of what I mean by that is um, folks always look to, I find, the kind of, um, folks always look to artists to say, um, you know, uh, b make the bridge. Go across the aisle. Are you just speaking to the choir? Don't you, you know, like, um, and it feels like besides the artists, um, very often that particular challenge is made to progressives and folks um, left of political center. Very, very, I find that it is the rare occasion where we say to a conservative person or to um, the Goldman Sachs executive, reach across the aisle, <laughs> make a bridge. To, like, that doesn't happen. But people want me to make art that's like a bridge to the other side. So my art is not a bridge. Um, I, I take that back. My art is a bridge to hopefully, ideally, a more inclusive, equitable future, one where our kids play together, the, the actual, you know, the, all, all the stuff that Kennedy spoke about in his extremely inspirational language. Man, have you ever listened to um, Kennedy's moonshot speech? I mean, the man was a writer. Yo, he was, he, was he, he, was, yes. he was a baller. And just, just like the, the soaring rhetoric, yeah. right? He was a writer. He was ext the, the flourish mm -hmm. um, in his language. I want to be that kind of artist that makes a, that makes a bridge to aspiration. But I don't want to make a bridge to a value system that I don't believe in that actually is, um, is structured to annihilate me and mine. So, um, you know, is it a privilege to be lost in community? No. I think that we want to, and we used this language um, uh, earlier in, in our meeting, this isn't so much about um, preaching to the choir, it's about um, connecting the committed. And I want to do that Uno work. Said that. Roberto that Uno said that. Yeah. Connecting the committed. Yeah, so let's do that work. So I got a question for me specifically. Why don't you fly your m mommy to visit you? Mom in to visit you. So I'm glad somebody asked this question. When you go to defineamerican.com, which I'm sure you will, you can <laughs> actually download a fact sheet. Mm. A one-page fact sheet that explains everything you need to know about illegal immigration and immigration in general. Um, I have found that this is the most controversial yet least understood issue in America. Mm. So much so that I, I did Bill Maher a couple of months ago, and before mm -hmm. we went on air, Bill goes, I don't understand why you just can't, get, can't just fix this thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's Bill Maher. Sure. So most people don't even understand that process. So my mm -hmm. mom is actually right now on the last five years of a 16-year waiting list to come. So if you're from the Philippines, Guatemala, or India, that's how long you wait, right? But if she were a French woman and she managed to get tickets to Hamilton over the weekend, she could just fly to New York and overstay her visa and become an undocumented white person that we never talk about. So that tells you how race and class and immigration all come together. Wow. Um, we only have like one minute left, and so I'm oh. gonna ask you this. Um, speaking again about, I love this whole freedom to, you know, the, 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 the designing of freedom. Like, mm -hmm. is there a particular work right now that, that you're looking at, you're reading, that inspires you? And if so, what is that? So what comes immediately to mind, two people two um, pieces of content come immediately to mind. The first is Kendrick Lamar's 2015 album, <laughs> To Pimp a Butterfly. Yep, yep. Um, and yeah, that, that work, I, I just think that he's a brilliant writer yeah. um, in general, but the way that that work soundtracked for many of us a particular time, you know, To Pimp a Butterfly was 
um, in the, in that moment, in that Mike Brown, Eric yeah, Garner yeah. was it was in that moment and was the soundtrack for yearning for so many of us. And so I still reference that album. And there's a young writer. Her name is Shanaka Hodge. Oh, um, I, yes. I find um, I find her work always, always to um, like her work is a call to action. Um, both because she's such a tremendous writer and also because it is clear and urgent and honest. Um, so that's what's doing it for me. What's doing it for you right now? Well, I'm in this horrible process of writing a book, mm. which I have not started, but I have to start it. <laughs> it's five years It's late. a process. It's a process. That's why it's a process. But I have to start it next month. And so I'm doing something really dangerous, which is I'm rereading all of Baldwin's books. Mm which is a dangerous thing to do. Um, dangerous in the best possible way. But I'm reminded of this, of this passage that I've been rereading a lot lately, which is, I'm gonna quote now, I hope I get it. He says in this thing, you know, everything now we must assume is in our hands. We don't have any reason to assume otherwise, right? And if we do not dare everything, <laughs> right? Yeah. The fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible and songs by former slaves is upon us. Mm. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, fire. Next time. I would argue that it's been burning. Yeah. And the burning has been happening, a lot of it I think from within. Mm. And I think to connect the within to without and the bridges that that's gonna take, mm -hmm. I find a lot of inspiration from. Word. And I find a lot of inspiration I, I never really thought of it that way, but I've always wanted to write my way into America. And in a way, I think I have done that. You are doing it. Um, but then, like, what does it mean to do that in a way that provides dignity to the sacrifice mm. of my mother? Mm. Who, like, 24 years ago put a son in a plane, and in some way I think of myself as still that 12-year-old boy in a plane, thinking, where am I going? Mm. So to honor that. Yes. So... Thank you so much for joining us. Let's honor them, man. Yes. yes. That was a lot, yo. Yeah.